The Earth has three main layers, two parts of the core, the dense, hot inner core, and the molten outer core. Then comes the mantle. And then follows the thin crust, the surface that supports life as we know it. At least, that's what we thought. Because now, scientists found a new mysterious layer located deep within the solid inner core. Earth's inner core is approximately two-thirds the size of the Moon. And made of nickel and solid iron, it's burning hot. The temperature at the center of our planet is the same as at the surface of the Sun. The outer core can reach almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's difficult to explore it because we can't go there. And it's like looking through a really dirty window of 3,200 miles of molten metal and rocks. But we can rely on laboratory experiments on heated pressurized rocks, signals from seismic waves, and computer models. When an earthquake hits, it sends out seismic shock waves. Those waves travel through layers at a different speed, depending on the direction they go and the material they move through. In the new study, a team of scientists set a data set of 100,000 deep earthquakes. Some of them went over 60 miles below the surface. When an earthquake happens on one side of our planet, scientists track its waves all along to the other side. Waves change when they come to the other side, so scientists try to understand the materials these waves have passed through. They found a new layer in the core of our planet thanks to earthquakes. Normally, shock waves travel along the equator, but down below, they digress and go into different directions, about 60 degrees to the side. When waves pass through the inner core going from north to south, they will travel more quickly than waves going through the core parallel to the equator. It's important to understand the core because it creates our magnetic field, which, in turn, protects the planet from things like solar winds that are charged particles coming from the sun. In the 1960s, we discovered the Earth pulsates every 26 seconds. It's like clockwork, a giant heartbeat. The ground is slightly shaking, but we mostly don't feel it. Researchers can still track it. Some of them think the continental shelf comes as a huge wave break under the oceans. For example, the highest part of the North American continent falls off into a deep abyssal plain. One theory says waves hit this spot, producing regular pulses. It's like having all kinds of drums. You hit them with your hands and accidentally slam that one spot that produces the right harmonic bang to rattle our entire planet. If this theory is true, we're lucky there are no more spots like this that can shake the Earth. Other scientists believe the pulsation happens because there's a volcano near the critical spot, the island of Sao Tome in the Bight of Bonny. You're walking, running, and jumping, but when you stop, it always feels like you're standing still. In reality, you're moving even when you're perfectly still because our planet is always on the move. Depending on where you're at, you could be spinning through the universe at more than 1,000 miles per hour. If you're on the equator, you'll move the fastest. Let's say you have a basketball spinning on your finger. Check the ball's equator. A random point on it has farther to go in just one spin than any point near your finger. That means the point on the equator is moving more quickly. The Earth is a planet that recycles all the time. The ground we're walking on is recycled. Our planet's rock cycle turns rocks of one type into another. That's a cycle that goes on and on. The depths of our planet are filled with magma. As magma is going out onto the surface, it hardens into rock. Tectonic processes like volcanic activity, earthquakes, mountain building, and all of the other processes that shape the surface of our planet bring that rock to the Earth's surface. When the rock is on the surface, erosion shapes it and shaves its bits off. Those small particles then get deposited. All the pressure coming from above compacts the particles into sedimentary rocks, like, for example, sandstone. Sedimentary rocks can also end up deeper and deeper under the Earth's surface. Since there's a lot of heat and pressure, they get cooked into metamorphic rocks. They can go back to the surface once again, or even end up being re-eroded. Sometimes the crust plates are pushing one under another, and this way, rocks can transform into magma once again. 
we've explored only 5% of the ocean so far. The ocean itself, as well as life below the seafloor, is still a mystery. The sediments that are underlying our oceans are home to different microorganisms that exist even at depths of 1.5 miles beneath the seafloor. There are microbes hidden deep inside volcanic rocks below the seafloor off of the parts of the Pacific, hidden under 870 feet of sediment. The biosphere under the seafloor is growing extremely slowly compared to life on the surface. Cell division happens every 10 to 1,000 years. Something's different about the Earth's axis. Climate changes and melting glaciers, mostly in the regions like the Himalayas and Alaska, made the axis shift. Our planet has two kinds of poles. Are the south and north magnetic poles. They affect they affect things such as drift and navigation. The axis that the Earth is spinning around is another kind of pole. It shifted a little bit over time, but we don't know exactly why. Researchers realize there are moving masses of water, pushing the Earth's axis eastward. Take a basin of water as an example. If you're moving it back and forth, sloshing makes the water move its weight all around. A similar thing is happening on a planetary level. No matter how large an earthquake is, no human could ever feel an earthquake on the opposite side of the Earth, although some people claim they did. In 2013, there was one near the Kuril Islands with a magnitude of 8.5. It went around 400 miles deep. It was so strong, people in Australia reported they could feel the ground shaking. The strongest earthquake happened in Chile in 1960 with a magnitude of 9.5. The rupture zone stretched from 311 miles to almost 620 miles along the country's coast. Earthquakes with a magnitude of 10 or higher can't happen. The magnitude depends on the length of the fault where it occurs. The longer the fault, the bigger the earthquake. A fault is a break in a part of the planet's crust. It has rocks on both sides, and they move past each other. We haven't found a fault long enough to generate earthquakes with a magnitude of 10 or more. If it happened, it would extend around most of our planet. An earthquake with a magnitude of 12 would require a fault larger than our planet. One side of our planet is getting colder than the other. The Earth has a system that keeps it warm from the inside, a red-hot liquid interior deep below the surface it spins and, at the same time, generates a magnetic field and gravity. That way, the Earth's core holds the atmosphere closer to the planet's surface. The Earth also absorbs heat from the Sun, mostly on the surface. The heat doesn't spread equally on all parts of the Earth. One side of the planet, the Pacific Hemisphere, is losing heat more quickly than another, the African Hemisphere. This happens because land traps more heat than the surface under the ocean. The seafloor is way thinner than the landmass. Also, the temperature caused by the heat coming from inside the Earth is getting lower because of huge amounts of cold water above it. Clouds are not just like some fluffy distant pieces of cotton. They weigh more than a million pounds and help regulate our planet's temperature. If you take all the water droplets in clouds and bring them to the surface, you could cover the planet with a liquid layer as thin as a human hair. It doesn't seem like a lot, but this water is crucially important for climate. We'd have warmer temperatures if it weren't for the clouds. Back in 2018, the biggest active underwater eruption ever happened, at least the one that we could officially record. Scientists followed earthquakes that struck the area in the western Indian Ocean off Madagascar. Between 2018 and 2021, over 11,000 earthquakes struck a small island called Mayan between Madagascar and Mozambique. The strongest one had a magnitude of 5.9. Until then, this area had been pretty peaceful. There had only been two earthquakes recorded over 50 years. Along with regular earthquakes, there were also some unusual seismic humps, like earthquakes at pretty low frequencies, forming deep underground. People couldn't feel those hums at the surface, 
but researchers around the world discovered them and realized they were related to volcanic activity no one actually noticed coming. Something strange happened. That underwater eruption created a giant skyscraper-sized volcano. This new underwater volcano turned out to be around one and a half times the height of One World Trade Center in New York, and almost 10 times bigger than the Statue of Liberty. The area where it appeared had been explored in 2014, but it was almost flat, peaceful, and empty back then. Now, there is an actual volcano nearly 8,500 feet below sea level. The volcano gets its magma from a super-profound reservoir located nearly 34 miles underground. It's the deepest reservoir of volcanic magma that we know about. The Earth has layers, and the middle one is kind of chunky. It's very much like peanut caramel filling many chocolates have. Research shows there are probably hunks of oceanic crust deep inside the Earth's liquid mantle. They're stuck there, creating large lumps in something that was supposed to be a smooth layer. Our planet has a rigid outer layer. It includes a hot upper mantle and cracked crust. The hot mantle moves and churns all the time, making the crust at the surface move too. This way, the oceanic crust dives into the depths and makes huge magma plumes go up toward the planet's surface. Scientists even found an ancient piece of the Pacific Ocean hundreds of miles underneath China. Those are the old remains of the Pacific seabed from long ago, and they were pulled downward below Earth's surface into the mantle transition zone. This rocky slab that used to be at the bottom of the ocean is made of the crust and some solid parts of the upper mantle. Most of the volcanic activity on our planet happens where we don't even see it, under the surface of the ocean. About 70% of all volcanic activity happens in the oceans, and mostly in the area of the South Pacific, with over 1,100 volcanoes squeezed into that area. Coastal cliffs, mountain changes, soils, and sediments that line valleys. These are only a small portion of the rocks on our planet. Oceans hide so much more deep down below the Earth's surface. In between the Earth's surface and its core is the mantle. It's a warm, thick layer of rock that moves and flows constantly. Some hundreds of miles below, there's a place where diamonds grow. As they form, they go through high temperatures and pressure, after which they eventually freeze. That way, when they arrive at the surface, scientists can explore their structure, find out how they formed, and understand better what's going on in the depths of our planet. Thanks to diamonds, they realize the mantle was very wet, and it possibly contained much more water than all the oceans on Earth. Our planet is eating up its own oceans. As its tectonic plates move, dive, and go beneath one another, they drag huge amounts of water into the Earth's interior. The water beneath the surface of our planet can help with developing magma and lubricate faults, which actually makes earthquakes more likely to happen. Water is actually stored in the minerals. It gets incorporated into the planet's crust when new oceanic plates form. They go through the process of bending and cracking as they grind under other plates, and huge amounts of water then go deep into the crust and mantle. Scientists research an area that's 18 miles under the surface. They realize these zones pull 3 billion teragrams, which is more than 2 billion pounds. Any ocean is like a whole new world. There are incredible sceneries below the surface. Magnificent waterfalls, lakes, and rivers. There are thick layers of salt beneath the seafloor, and rivers and lakes form because seawater goes through those layers and dissolves them, creating something that resembles pools. The dissolved salt makes the surrounding water denser. That water then settles there, which eventually forms underwater lakes or rivers. But there are also mountain chains, trenches, canyons. There's a canyon in the Bering Sea with more than 8,500 feet of vertical relief. This makes the Grand Canyon look way smaller than it is, since the underwater canyon is nearly 2,500 feet deeper. Deep parts of the ocean are really cold. The temperature of the water can be about 40 degrees, but at the bottom, water can get boiling hot. There are hydrothermal vents in the seafloor. Those are the hot springs located at the edges of tectonic plates. The water they release can reach a temperature of up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. 
but the pressure at such depths is very intense. So intense, no human being can handle it. Still, it's the pressure that keeps the water from boiling. Ocean depth is on average 2.3 miles. Light waves can still enter at 3,280 feet, even though it's in a very small amount. So all the mysteries hidden below that point remain in total darkness. The actual illuminated part of the ocean goes until 600 feet. Even though the sun gives us light, most of our planet is dark all the time. It's all because of the oceans, covering over 70% of our planet. The loudest sound that came from an ocean, and of the loudest sounds ever recorded, came from an ice quake. It was so loud, researchers picked it up by sensors more than 3,000 miles away. There was a seismic activity that made frozen ground break down. The Antarctic ice sheet is bigger than the continental part of the United States and Mexico together. A big iceberg from Antarctica holds over 20 billion gallons of water, which could make a 5-year water supply for a million people. Humans can generally drink sea ice, although we can't drink seawater. As time goes by and the ice ages, the brine trapped between ice crystals drains out. That way, ice becomes fresh enough to consume it. If all the ice sheets and glaciers we have on the Earth melted at the same time, the sea level would rise another 260 feet, which is just a little shorter than the Statue of Liberty, the height of a 26-story building. Clams lived long enough to tell us more about ocean's past. Ancient mollusks could live for more than 500 years. To learn more about a tree, you can use its rings to see how old it is. To learn how old a mollusk is, you can examine its rings within the shell and tell. This is also how scientists get information about the ocean, climate, and whatsoever. Clams can help take a look at what happened about a thousand years ago. The Earth doesn't have four, but five oceans now. The new one, called the Southern Ocean, was officially recognized only a few months ago. It borders the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, so scientists couldn't agree if it's really a new ocean or just part of the colder regions of these three. We don't only divide oceans on maps. Each has different conditions for unique marine species. For example, the Southern Ocean has leopard seals, orcas, minke whales, emperor penguins, and other animals that live in cold, icy seas. It's also home to krill, small creatures that look like shrimp and are food for many bigger animals that live there. Life on our planet started about 3.5 billion years ago. I wasn't around then. It's still a mystery how and when exactly, but some theories say life could have first emerged in the depths of the ocean. A few years ago, scientists found microscopic tubes and filaments within rocks formed about 4 billion years ago. These rocks are fragments of ancient oceanic crust. Also, these tiny tubes and filaments are similar to microbes that can still be found on hydrothermal vents in deep parts of the ocean. The idea is these living cells found conditions to stay alive in tiny rocky pores inside the chimneys of those vents and started the amazing adventure of the evolution of life on our planet. About 800,000 years ago, I wasn't around then, a gigantic asteroid soared through space and plummeted toward Earth. It slammed into our planet with enormous force. It blanketed 10% of Earth with shiny black and green lumps of rocky debris, known as tektites. Tektites are pieces of rock that get liquefied by the heat of a meteorite impact. Then they cool down to look like dark, glassy pebbles. A trail of these tektites was strewn across Southeast Asia and reached all the way to eastern Antarctica. This is how scientists know this giant meteorite crash happened. Well, researchers spent nearly 100 years trying to find the gigantic crater caused by the impact. But tektites were too widespread. That's why they couldn't pinpoint the exact location. Until recently. A team of experts from different universities tried to discover the ground zero of the meteorite impact. They investigated several craters in China and Cambodia, but none seemed to be created by a meteorite crash. The experts then decided to investigate Laos. It's a country where they discovered the largest and most concentrated number of tektites. After ruling out all visible craters, the team came up with a new theory. What if the crater is hidden by something? In search of the potential crater, the scientists measured gravity readings at different locations all across Laos. 
at the side of an ancient volcanic eruption, below thick, dense layers of cooled volcanic lava, they discovered a severe gravitational anomaly. Ooh. It turned out to be a large, elongated crater, over 300 feet deep and spreading 8 miles wide and 11 miles long. Based on the location and the crater's enormous size, scientists believe this is the impact site of the ancient meteorite. Meanwhile, over 2 billion years ago, long before the age of dinosaurs, Earth was struck by one of the largest asteroids to ever hit our planet. The asteroid was approximately 6 to 9 miles across and created the biggest impact crater on Earth. This is the Vredefort crater. You can find it in present-day South Africa. When it was formed, it had a gigantic diameter of 186 miles. Over the centuries, the massive crater slowly eroded away into the Vredefort dome. That's a rocky hill formation that was the central side of the asteroid's impact. This formation is so large that it can be seen from space. Today, the Vredefort dome is a recognized World Heritage site. It's also home to several towns and communities that encourage tourists to come and visit the ancient crater. In 1943, one pilot strayed from his regular flight path to avoid dangerous weather conditions. Flying over Quebec, Canada, he spotted a large, perfectly circular basin. That is how the Pingualuit crater was discovered. Around 1.4 million years ago, a meteorite hit this spot, creating this small but deep impact crater. It has a diameter of 2 miles and a depth of 1,300 feet. A lake of deep blue water has formed at the bottom of the crater. It's said that this lake contains some of the purest water in the world as it has no inlets or outlets. It means that the lake is only filled by rains and melting snow. The lake is home to one species of fish, the Arctic char. The Sudbury Basin is also in Canada. Formed over 1.8 billion years ago, it's one of the largest and oldest impact craters in the world. It's located in Ontario, but the impact from the collision was so powerful that debris from it was found 500 miles away in Minnesota. Unlike most impact craters that have a circular shape, the Sudbury Basin is an oval. It's 39 miles long with a width of 19 miles. The original impact site might have been a whopping 10 miles deep, but its modern-day version is much shallower. The asteroid that created the basin carried a high concentration of natural minerals. This made the soil in the crater incredibly fruitful. Today, its floor is home to numerous fruit and vegetable farms. The unique crater formation of Sudbury Basin was used to train Apollo astronauts before they embarked on their missions to the moon. Perhaps the most famous meteorite of all is the Chicxulub. That's the meteorite responsible for wiping out 75% of all plant and animal life on Earth including the dinosaurs. The Chicxulub meteorite had a diameter of 6 miles when it struck Earth 66 million years ago. The crater now lies off the coast of Mexico, hidden deep beneath the seabed. It's around 93 miles across and 12 miles in depth. Recently, scientists managed to drill deep down into the highest peak of the impact crater to collect rock samples. They discovered that the disappearance of dinosaurs wasn't caused by the giant size of the meteorite or the scale of the blast. It was because of the exact location where the Chicxulub hit Earth. The meteorite struck part of our planet that was densely filled with a mineral compound called gypsum. It's a soft sulfate mineral that is typically used as a fertilizer. The collision blasted so much sulfur into the air that it blocked out the sun. This caused the prolonged dark winter that doomed the dinosaurs. One of the youngest craters on Earth is the Behringer Crater in Winslow, Arizona. The Behringer Crater is also one of the best preserved craters on Earth. It was formed 50,000 years ago when a heavy meteorite made mostly of iron plummeted down from space. Earth's atmosphere barely slowed down the massive chunk of metal. It collided with the ground with incredible force. The meteorite vaporized upon impact, leaving very few remains. The crater left by this powerful explosion was named after the man who identified it in 1903. It was a mining engineer named Daniel Behringer. The diameter of the crater is 3,900 feet, and it goes 560 feet deep. The Behringer family still owns the impact site to this day. You can visit the crater and take a guided tour around its rim. The Papagai Crater in Siberia is one of the most interesting craters on Earth. An asteroid impact over 35 million years ago formed this massive basin. The crater is 62 miles across, which makes it the fourth largest one in the world. This crater is unique as it's home to one of the largest diamond deposits in the world. 
The intense pressure from the collision transformed the graphite at the impact site into diamonds. Scientists say that the crater contains trillions of carats of diamonds, but no one has ever mined them due to the site's remote location and lack of infrastructure. In the year 1530 BCE, a meteoroid entered Earth's atmosphere before shattering into pieces. The meteorite's burning fragments rained down on Earth and crashed into the planet's surface. As a result, a group of craters appeared on a small Estonian island, Sarama. The largest crater is a 360-foot-wide perfect circle. It's 70 feet deep and filled with blue water. Eight smaller craters that appeared during the collision can be found within a half-mile radius of the largest crater. The impact of the meteorite fragments caused the trees on the islands to catch fire. Almost all forests burned down. Luckily, the woodlands have now grown back, and the craters are a popular hiking destination for tourists. A meteorite struck the area we now know as Quebec, Canada, around 200 million years ago. This collision created the sixth largest impact crater in the world. It had a diameter of 40 miles. Over the century, the outer rim of the crater has filled up with water. It's now known as Manicougan Reservoir. The impact crater lake is so large it can be seen from space, and its strange shape gave the lake its nickname, the Eye of Quebec. The oldest meteorite crater in the world is in Western Australia. The Yarrabooba Crater is 2.2 billion years old. Well, that gets my vote for the best crater name. The impact site is so ancient that the original crater has completely eroded away. Yarrabooba's diameter was around 19 to 43 miles. Scientists managed to figure out the age of the impact site by analyzing the ancient crystals and minerals found within the crater.